Today I've got what I think is a really cool number theory problem that comes from an Indonesian math contest from 2009. And what I think is great about it is really the tricks and classic results that we will use along the way to our solution. So let's see what we have. We say that an ordered pair of integers, m comma n, is good, so we're defining this word good, if m divides n squared plus n and n divides m squared plus m. So maybe to get yourselves warmed up, you could find a bunch of ordered pairs that are good, just to get an idea of what these things look like. But now on to the problem. So given a and b bigger than one, that are relatively prime, in other words, their GCD is one, let's show that we can find M and N so that the ordered pair M, N is good, A divides M and B divides N, yet A does not divide N and B does not divide M. Okay, so let's maybe see how we can do this with an exploratory example, and then we'll kind of back engineer this exploratory example into a general solution. Okay, so let's take, well, we can take A and B as long as their GCD is one. So maybe we'll take A equal to four and B equal to five. Okay, but what does that tell us? Well, since we have this GCD, well, since we have this divisibility requirement right here, that means that M is equal to four times X and N is equal to five times Y. Again, from this divisibility requirement right here. Okay, and then also by the goodness, we have the following. So we have M divides n squared plus n, and n divides m squared plus m. But of course, what we would like to do is translate that into language with x and y built out of our four and five, or more generally, our a and b. Okay, so let's see. This one translates to four x divides. Let's see, it'll be 5y times 5y plus 1. There I factored the n out. Okay, well, let's maybe box that off so these don't get confused with each other. Okay, and then let's do the same kind of thing over here. So what I mean by the same kind of thing is translate that into the language of this. So that means that 5 times y must divide 4 times x times 4x plus 1. Okay, so now we have these two kind of interesting conditions on x and y over here. Okay, so what have we used so far? Well, we've used the goodness of M and N, we've used the divisibility of M and N by A and B, but we haven't used this like lack of divisibility here. So let's see if we can use that. Well, in our language, A not dividing N is the same thing as saying four does not divide five times Y. But notice that four doesn't divide five, but that means that four also does not divide Y. Okay, so we know that four does not divide Y. And then likewise, from this B does not divide M, we know that five cannot divide four X, which really leads us to five does not divide X. Okay, so let's put a little box around those as well. Okay, so now let's put these kind of things together right here. So since four does not divide Y, well, we know that four doesn't divide five, it doesn't divide Y, that means it must divide five Y plus one. So just to be very clear, that's from this bit right here and this bit right here. So let's maybe put that as a yellow branch of this orange box. So like I said, it is four divides five Y plus one. And then likewise, let's look at another branch. So let's look at five does not divide X along with this five Y divides four X times four X plus one. So five is not gonna divide four, it won't divide X, but that means it must divide four X plus one. So that's gonna be the red branch here. 
Okay, so we've got five divides four X plus one. Okay, nice. And look what I did there. Uh, yellow and red makes orange, so that's cool. <laughs> okay, so now let's see where we can go from there. I'm gonna translate this into the language of modular arithmetic. So notice this is equivalent to saying that five Y plus one is congruent to zero modulo four. And likewise, four X plus one is congruent to zero modulo five. Okay, nice. And then we can take that and move some things around. So we can subtract one from both sides of this equation, but let's notice that negative one mod four is equal to three. So that's gonna give us five y is congruent to three mod four. Oh, but five is congruent to one mod four. So we actually don't need that five there. So that gives us y is itself congruent to three modulo four. Okay, nice. But now we can subtract one here and we get four X is congruent to four mod five, but then we can cancel the four. Well, we're allowed to do that because it's relatively prime to five and that leaves us with X is congruent to one modulo five. So we've got that like congruence set up right there. And now we're gonna do like something which is kind of a basic problem solving idea and that is asking yourself, can you simplify the setup? So here we've got a dependence on X and Y, and maybe we would hope that we only have a dependence on one thing there. And so this is maybe where I put in here, like is a simplification possible? And what I mean that by that is, could we possibly have X equal to Y? So that would leave us with X is congruent to three modulo four, and X is also congruent to one mod five. So we need to look for a number X that satisfies both of those rules. But I think we can just like think of that in our minds a little bit, go through some values of X, and we'll see that X equals 11 does that. And so 11 is three more than eight, so that makes it three mod four, and it's one more than 10, that makes it one mod five. So we've got X equals 11 here. But if X equals 11, what is M and N? So that means that M equals, well, 44, and N equals 55. And now we just have to check that those are good. Well, I guess we kind of already know that they're good just based off of our construction here, but we might as well like recheck just to make sure we haven't made a mistake along the way. And you can indeed check that M squared plus M, which is equal to 44 squared plus 44, is in fact equal to 55 times 36. But notice that's equal to 36 times n in our setup. So let's see, the fact that m squared plus m is a multiple of n means that we have, let's see, this condition right here, n divides m squared plus m. And then I'll let you check that you get this other condition as well. Of course, like I said, all of these follow from our like original assumption that fueled all of this. But that being said, it's just nice to check that it works out in the end so that we didn't make a mistake along the way. Okay, so now let's take a step back and see exactly what happened here that we could generalize. And I think maybe we need to go back to this point right here and how did we get this congruence? I think this portion right here, this four and five is pretty obvious. So let's maybe fill this in a little bit at a time. So here we have X is congruent to something mod A, because four is equal to A, and X is also congruent to something modulo B. But what are those in terms of A and B? Well, I think it's actually pretty easy to see from here. And I'll do that by maybe taking this first congruence and writing it up here. Notice this is the same thing as 5y congruent to negative one modulo four, which in turn is the same thing as y is congruent to 
negative five inverse mod four. And generally it's kind of sketchy to write these things down, but since five and four are relatively prime, we know that five has a multiplicative inverse mod four. But the important thing is that five is equal to b. So that gives us some motivation here to say that this is negative b inverse. And likewise, by a similar calculation, that is negative a inverse. So that's how we should choose x, so, so that it's congruent to each of those mod a and b. Now you might say, well, how are we guaranteed that a solution to such a system of congruences exists? Well, it's exactly something called the Chinese remainder theorem. So that might be a nice thing to look up because we're about to move into our general solution where we use that. Okay, let's do that. So now I think we've appropriately motivated our general solution. So let's get at it. So let's say given A and B bigger than one such that the GCD of A and B is equal to one, by the Chinese remainder theorem, which has like a general shortening of CRT, we can find some integer x such that x satisfies the following two congruences. So x is congruent to negative b inverse modulo a, and simultaneously x is congruent to negative a inverse modulo b. Okay, nice. And now we're actually gonna use this congruence right here at the very end. So I'm gonna maybe put like a magenta star here with maybe a blue circle around it because like I said, we're gonna use that near the end. But before we do that, we've got a little bit of work to do. So what we will indeed do is work off of this congruence, which you know we brought into existence by the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, so let's maybe multiply both sides of this equation by, well, b in this case and a in this case. So that's gonna give us bx is congruent to negative one modulo a, and in turn, that's gonna give us ax is congruent to negative one modulo b. And then we can move that one step further, and we'll see that that means that bx plus one is congruent to one, is congruent to zero mod a, whereas ax plus one is congruent to zero modulo b. Okay, nice. And now we're gonna do one more thing to this, and we're gonna multiply this entire congruence by, well, b times x in this first bit and a times x in this second bit. But since we're multiplying it all by x, that means we can actually include an x in both of the, well, what we're taking the mod with respect to. So multiplying this first one all by bx will give us bx all squared plus bx congruent to zero modulo ax. So you might be worried that how did we include the x right here? Well, I think multiplying by bx makes it clearly congruent to zero mod a, but then also every term has an x in here, so that means it's congruent to zero mod x as well. But if it's congruent to zero mod a and zero mod x, then it's congruent to zero mod their product. And now let's go from there. We can have ax all squared plus ax is congruent to zero modulo bx from doing the same thing on the second congruence. Now let's take each of these and rewrite them as divisibility rules as our original problem was in the language of divisibility up here. So this first one is the same thing as saying that ax divides bx squared plus bx, whereas this second one is the same thing as saying bx divides ax squared plus ax. Okay, nice. But that gives us some real motivation to set ax equal to m and bx equal to n based on, based on these two things being satisfied. So let's do that. So let's set m equal to ax and n equal to bx. And now let's immediately note 
that that tells us that m divides n squared plus n, n divides m squared plus m, which means that m and n is good. In other words, that ordered pair is good. Okay, so that's the first condition that we need down here. That's good. So let's say also we have what? We have A divides M and B divides N. Okay, well that's the second condition that we have over here. Let's maybe like box these up so that we have them. Okay, so we have M divides N is good. And then we have this divisibility condition. So that means that all that's left is to show that A does not divide N and B does not divide N. So let's write that down. A does not divide N and B does not divide M. And how can we do that? Well, we're gonna do this via a contradiction. So let's, by way of contradiction, suppose that in fact we do have A dividing N and then we'll come up with a contradiction. Okay, but what does that tell us? That tells us that A divides B times X. Okay, okay, well that's simply just by the definition of N right here, but then A and B are relatively prime. That was one of our original assumptions, but since A and B are relatively prime, that means that A must divide X. Okay, but now back into this congruence that I said was important earlier, let's see what that leaves us with. So that's gonna leave us with, well, okay, x is zero mod a because a divides x. So that means that negative b inverse is congruent to zero modulo a. But, I mean, that kind of immediately gives us that B itself is congruent to zero mod A. But that's our contradiction because we know that A and B are relatively prime. So this says that A divides B. So that's nonsense. So that leads us to a contradiction. What did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this assumption right here that A divided N. That means absolutely A cannot divide N. But via a parallel argument, we would get that B does not divide M. It's essentially the same, just replacing A's with B's and M's with N's. So that means we have this condition right here. So what have we done? Well, we have indeed found an M and N satisfying these one, two, three rules, which is exactly what we needed to, to solve this problem. Okay, so we used a lot of number theory in this video. So including the Chinese remainder theorem and a ton of stuff working mod this and mod that. I actually have a full course on number theory on my second channel, Math Major. There should be a link on the screen right now if you'd like to check that out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.